Welcome everybody to what is most likely going to be my most intense recap ever. A lot of you requested this, the Paris Grand Chess Tour Rapid and Blitz. I couldn't cover it because I was playing my tournament in Las Vegas, but this is five days of Rapid Chess, 25 minute and 10 second bonus, and two days of Blitz Chess, five minute with two second bonus. Now, 10 players. Etienne Bacro of France only played the Rapid portion, and Vladimir Kramnik replaced them, former world champion, to play the Blitz. So, 10 players, but also kind of 11. Uh, three days of three games of the Rapid, followed by two days of nine games every single day. 27 games overall. Um, let's have some fun. Timestamps on the video player, as always. Here we go. This is day number one. Ali Reza Firuja and Wesley So. Wesley So just came from Bucharest, Romania. So he played a classical chess tournament, and so did a lot of the other players in this field. Um, this game was absolutely insane. It's a 25-minute game with 10 seconds bonus. And we have an Italian, okay, bishop c4, bishop c5. In 25-minute chess, uh, by the way, I'm just going to tell you right now, buckle up. This is going to be a wild recap. Uh, in 25-minute chess, like, th th there is still a desire to play some solid openings, which is exactly what we see here. We see an Italian with this bishop g5 pin. Um, but the position explodes very quickly on move 10, uh, where you notice that one side has castled and the other side has not. And you would think that the most natural move here is castles, but it's most certainly not that. In rapid chess, you try to play a little bit more aggressively because your opponent doesn't have enough time to figure everything out. G5. So this is what we want. And Wesley plays G5, bishop G3, and rotates the knight back to H7 to reinforce this and try to play H5, H4, maybe F5, F4. We're going to see. Ali Reza plays B4, and here's the other idea behind knight H7, knight back to F8 to potentially you know, get the knight moving and jump it into f4. But Ali Reza is expanding quite quickly as well with d4. The more Wesley goes back, the more Ali Reza comes forward. Knight g6, b5, knight a5. Now the knight attacks the bishop, and Ali Reza plays this move. Now this move does make sense to prevent g4, but anytime you push a pawn in front of your king like this, it's known as a hook, and it's going to be a target for your opponent. And a target for your opponent, it becomes g4. Now you gotta do something. If you don't, if you just move your knight, I'd take, and then I keep pushing. And if you if you take, well, now you see what I what I, I utilized your hook against you. I mean, this is only good for one person, and that person's name starts with W, ends in Y, and has four letters in the middle. I'll let you figure it out who it is. Um, knight H2, Queen G5. I mean, Wesley is just on the verge of delivering some sort of checkmate here, like Queen H5, Knight F4. I mean, he just needs to get rid of this bishop. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Just get rid of the bishop. You can't bribe the bishop to then leave. Um, you know, otherwise the Catholic Church might not be in existence anymore. So, queen to e3, queen to h6. Wesley's so close. Wesley's so close. f6. No pun intended, by the way. Knight back to h5. Oh, 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 it's right there. But now there's going to be a queen trade, potentially. Now, for some reason, Ali Reza decides to keep the tension. And here I was shocked Wesley did not just play queen h7. Uh, just take this and, and, and come on down. I guess... Uh, you know, I, 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 I guess you're going to take with the F-pawn or something and, like, survive on F2. Or maybe knight G3 and king F1, king E2. But instead of that, uh, Wesley goes here, and he ends up sliding the queen forward. Now, at this point, the evaluation is minus 5. Like, his attack is absolutely devastating. But somehow, Ali Reza just created enough confusion to keep Wesley from delivering the final blow. I mean, Wesley is right there, but Ali Reza's king is on the verge of escape. Bishop a7, knight f1. This is this is what I call cocoon defense. Let me just go like this. Just wrap yourself around with all your pieces. King to e7, look at this move, trying to mobilize the rook. Um, I believe this was Wesley's last chance uh, to deliver some sort of knockout, uh, and he could have delivered it n not with king to e7, but apparently king to d8. And if you ask me to explain the difference, uh, the difference is, I, 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 I don't know the difference between king e8 and king d8, I mean king e7 and king d8. Um, and, e, well, the, the difference is this, is that if you go king to e7, Ali Reza now can uh, start to open the center. Because your king is in the center. Whereas if the king went to d8, I mean, you know, you're, you're not really, you're not here. Knight f5 doesn't hit your king, so... Uh, but he goes here, and now Ali Reza's running. He's got knight f5 check, bishop f5, and folks... Um, Maybe what uh, Wesley missed, I, I, I don't know, I haven't asked him, is that if this trade happens, the bishop is now covering the checkmate square. 
you know, it looks like here that white cannot move the knight away, and uh, that's correct, but white actually can, because it comes with check, and you're just in time to defend, and all of a sudden, uh, Ali Reza's got a good position, and it's Wesley So, whose king is stuck in the middle, and is like a move or two away from getting torn apart, and rook takes e5, rook sacrifice, knight takes e5, rook to e1, now the king is on the run, and what is going on here? This bishop is totally out of the game. And yet, it's still Wesley who's creating checkmate threats. You only get games like this in rapid chess, right? Okay, now we have f6. f6 is a beautiful pawn sacrifice. No matter who you take with, I've now opened up my queen. I've got my rook coming. I've got my knight coming when I'm ready. You've got no back rank infiltration on b1 because my queen covers it. So all of a sudden, I will have the four attacking pieces in this game. Queen to f5 mobilizing. Bishop h2 check. If you take it, is it mate? Uh, no, because you hide on f1. Who? Who's playing this game for a win? I mean, Ali Reza is about to play qu uh, queen to e6. He's about to, I mean, he, he, he's, he's coming in. Now here, there's a, a beautiful defensive resource for Wesley, rook b1. And that rook, that, that rook move is impossible, but you have this. And then you sacrifice your queen and your rook, but you get it all back. And now we just have a, still a kind of unpleasant end game, but holdable. But he goes here, and now it's plus 10. It's plus 10 for white. Ali Reza has to choose. Does he play bishop here or does he play queen e6? Queen e6 and he would pick this pawn up with check as well and then continue his attack. But he chooses this and now it's only plus two because after takes takes, king g6. Queen back to e4 check looking to dislodge the king before taking that rook over there. Check again. Check forward. Now queen takes e5. And Wesley bails out and starts to defend his king with the rooks, but he's still losing. He's still losing. Queen d7, rook f8. And now queen g7, Ali Reza had to play queen d2. He had to play queen d2 because after check, check, like let's say black just continues to wobble around. e7 is the killing move. Why is it the killing move? Well, I, you can take with check, but then just king e1. If you play a move like rook e8, it looks like you're surviving, but there's no way to defend your rooks. You just can't defend them. They can't defend each other. And if you stick around on the back rank, queen d8! <laughs> the queen had to stay on the d file, defended by the pawn. There was, there's no way for black to get back and defend everything. But Ali Reza doesn't stay on the d file. He goes over here. And this allows Wesley to cocoon. But now Wesley is still losing. Wesley, after queen to g7, had to play king f5. <laughs> <laughs> blocking his own rooks, the idea being your, your rook needs to stay defended so that you can move this rook, but he missed it too. This game was completely nuts, and it ends with this king hunt. Like, where is Ali Reza going? Rook e8, queen h6, king g3, but somehow, wait, now Wesley's trying to promote a pawn of his own? What is happening? And look at this move, rook back to f8, utilizing the pin on the king, Still, this position is, 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 is within, within grasp of being won, um, but all of a sudden, Wesley, Wesley has now brought his pawn and king all the way down, and the game ends with perpetual check. Oh, 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 oh. All right, everybody take a deep breath. Uh, this was just one of many, many exciting games, but I don't want to make a one-hour recap on, uh, you know, just, ju just of this entire thing. Folks... These are your standings and these are your players after the first uh, day of action. So, Richard Report, Etienne Bacro. I wonder if you guys can hear that, by the way. Um, there's apparently some construction going on in the back of my building that I was not notified about. So, if you hear some whirring. Um, this is the standings. And the way it works is that for a win, you get two points. For a draw, you get one point. Um, on the overall standings. So, here, if you notice, the top guy has one win and two draws. Uh, yes, that's two out of three, but that actually is double that because the rapid games are worth double, but that's confusing. Anyway, uh, take a look at the players if you'd like. Uh, I am now going to move on to the second uh, uh, the second day, so rounds four, five, and six. Now, this game, I'm going to show you Jan Levon. Uh, Anish Giri called it one of the best games he's ever seen. So, high praise, okay? Uh, C4, knight f6, and we have something known as a neo Catalan. It's basically when white plays the Catalan setup, but doesn't play d4, delays it. Delays it because at any moment you can go back to the Catalan or you can just play b3. And you can defend your center pawn with this, and sometimes your pawn goes here. Levon takes right away on c4. Now, white can win this back in a few ways. Knight to a3. That line is not great because actually black can just go here. 
And if you give a check, black has this nice idea of B5. It's a known equalizing line. Well, I say that, but the super GMs might have even better prep. So we, and queen A4 is another way. Just give a check and go here. And you say, why would you do this? Like, why would white waste time with the queen? Well, this bishop is passive. This bishop has the open diagonal. Um, knight E5, queen C8. And as you're going to see in a couple moves, you know, it's very simple, uh, very, very, very slightly better, but probably just completely equal position. Uh, and, you know, we have a position that looks like this and castles. And essentially, white says, okay, I have two bishops. I'm obviously happy. Uh, my queen is exerting kind of nagging pressure over here. And, you know, we'll see what I do with these pawns. Maybe I'm going to play for d4. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just put a pawn on d3 and be flexible. Or the benefit of having the bishop pair, as you're going to see throughout this game, you know, let me, Jan, is, Jan is just very solid. I mean, he's, he's not committing anything. Look, he's just playing simple moves. Brings the queen back. Why is he bringing the queen back? e3, queen e2, like, look, at, look at what the queen's journey has been, it's like a4, c4, f4, back to d2, back to e2, but the benefit of having a position that looks like this, that you don't have to commit anything, you just play very solidly, and actually black taking the space here is a little bit overextended, black's a little bit overextended here, knight b4, you know, Levon's trying to instigate, but this is like waving a red flag or like a, you know, a towel in front of a bull because the guy with the two bishops who hasn't committed his pawns yet has all of the potential. Does that make sense? If you've already shown your hand, like Levon pushed all his pawns, doesn't have the bishop pair, he can't really do a whole lot more in this game, but because Jan hasn't committed any of his pawns or his pieces, he can, and now he does. Knight takes d5, opening up the dark squared bishop, and now he's ready with this break d4. And everything in his position makes sense. All the pawns repel the black pieces. Um, the bishop has pressure on the center. The rook has pressure on the c-file. This rook has pressure here. This is pressure here. This is pressure here. And let's not forget, the bishop does target g7. All of the potential in the position rests with white. Knight goes back to f6. That's a slight inaccuracy because now I take. And any way you end up taking back on c5, you will have a problem. He takes on d1. That's a check, so I can't take your queen. Rook takes. And now let's see how Levon decides to take. He takes back like this. But what is the problem of bishop c5, folks? The fact that bishop takes f6 will open up the king. And that's immediately what he does. Whether or not this is winning is still up for debate. Obviously, it's not just completely winning, but it gives white potential, which is all you need. Queen to h5. Potential is all you need, by the way, as well. Always keep that in mind. So, find the best version of yourself. Bishop takes a3. Levon is clearly not afraid of this attack. So, rook to d7. Staying patient. Doesn't just gobble the pawn. Also would have been a decent move, but he plays rook d7 because this forces black to play this very passive move, rook f8. No questions. You gotta play rook f8 or you get checkmated. And now, again staying patient. Bishop to e4. Now we've got all sorts of threats lurking. You would think it's as easy as playing the move f5. You would think it's just as easy as playing this move f5. But uh, Jan is a genius. And um, this is why Anish called it the best attacking game he's ever seen. Queen takes h6. What? I don't understand. This rook is locked away over here. It can't ever make it to this side of the board. So what happens if I just take? I don't understand. Well, what Levon had missed and what Jan had foreseen is the fact that the rook is not stuck. It has a one-way ticket to this side of the board by virtue of sacrifice, by virtue of geometry. And if you take, it's actually your only move. You have to lose your queen. Um, you have to lose your queen in a different way. Levon does it by sacrificing for a pawn um, and then taking the rook. But rook g5 is just mate. And if you had played f6, then I don't go back. I actually just check you and my rook finds a home on h5 to mate you. Look at this combination. All the, by the way, this had to have been foreseen from here. He takes, he plays queen h5. And he probably was like, okay, my position's good. Bishop a3, he's like, rook d7, this is the only move, I'm gonna go here. This is very dangerous, because if black plays something like queen c5 trying to get a queen trade, well then I go here, this is problematic, like, I will find my way here, and yet still this might be the best thing for black to do. f5, and this, I mean, what a move. I always like to say the impossible moves in chess, when they are possible, are devastating. And now you have queen versus rook and bishop, in positions like this, where it's queen versus rook and piece, or some sort of imbalance of pieces, um, 
Peace coordination is everything. If you can coordinate your rook and your bishop and your pawns together to create no weaknesses, you're happy. The problem is that right now you've got sitting ducks all over the board. And the, the, the fact that your king is always weak, it can be used as a target to then redirect my queen to the other side of the board. There is just no way to guard everybody. And Jan locks away the bishop first. Beautiful game. Forces the bishop out and now has this targeting those weak pawns. And again, the king is weak, so you can always make it back over here and target these pawns. And black is just not in time, and the game ends with queen c8 with the distant queen attack on both sides, and Levon resigns. Uh, absolutely beautiful attack. Uh, Nepo is like my spirit animal with his chess. Just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, this is game of the day uh, for round number two, and um, we're going to speed things up here, but this was the, these were the standings after the second day. So, a couple of storylines. Ali Reza struggling. Ali Reza only making draws and losing. Richard Report, who's actually uh, we haven't some of you haven't seen him in these online events. He's one of the he is one of the top t top eleven players, top twelve players in the world. Um, Etienne Bacro began to make a name for himself on day two, and you'll notice the standings are extremely close. You'll notice the standings are extremely close. By the way, remember that scoring system, one and two points? You see the two points mean win, and one point means draw, and zero point means loss. It's very close, seven to six. So. On that note, uh, I want to take you to the third day of action in the rapid portion. Um, and this was uh, Caruana Bacro is what I'm going to get you started with. Uh, Etienne is one of the strongest players in France. And he ha we haven't seen him a lot in these online events. Uh, but this is over the board. This is like live. Uh, and he's playing Fabiano Caruana. And he plays a classical Sicilian versus Fabiano Caruana. This is the uh, from day number three. And we have a, uh, a rouser. A rouser variation which looks like this. And this is a, always a really fascinating variation to me because White Castle's queenside, Black puts two bishops very passively like this, but like I said, it the position's like a coil, like a like a like a slingshot. So you're gonna pew, right? You're gonna like less space, but King B1, Rook C8 attacking on the queen side, H4 attacking on the king side, and black plays like this. And black basically plays like this to stop G4. Okay? Fabiano backs up to d2, so the queen is not a target in the center of the board, and he's ready to, to figure out whether he wants to attack down the middle on the king side, or b5. Now knight comes back from e, uh, from c3 to e2, so that the queen side pawns don't hit the knight. Queen c7. Bishop g5. And you want to target the knight. a5. Knight d4, targeting the b5 pawn. Rook b8, doesn't want the b5, the b5 pawn taken. b4, f4. Gonna have an explosion in the center. It's coming very soon. A4, rook e1, queen comes up on c5, attacking the knight. Knight backs up. We're ready. Here we go. E5. You say, why hasn't black castled? Very normal in the rouser to not castle or delay it as long as possible. Very often your king actually is safer in the center, which makes it exciting. Bishop takes f3. Pawn takes f6. Now there is a rook hanging, a bishop hanging, and another bishop hanging. Black responds with bishop takes d1. White responds with pawn takes pawn. Not even pawn takes bishop, but pawn takes pawn attacking the rook. Rook goes here. That's not complicated. Queen d1. He wants to play queen h5, queen h7. That's what he wants. He also wants f5 maybe in the future to rip open the center. But you know what? Black is like ready. Black is right there. He's ready and something's going to happen. Queen d4, queen d1. And uh, here a really nice move from back row. Uh, very nice move. Kind of understanding how to keep the tension in this position. Bishop f6 focusing on the queen side attack and uh, making white make this very unfortunate decision to have to do this. And now white's attack has been stopped. Back row wins the complications against the second rated player in the world in classical. It is in classical, not in rapid, but... And uh, not very often we see Fabiano outplayed with the white pieces. I mean, back row is playing with the black pieces here, just very calmly outplays Fabiano. Uh, hides his king. Queen runs in. The queen comes right back to d4, pressures this, and defends everybody. And uh, the rest of the game is kind of cleanup crew. Rook takes g2. Fabiano plays a3. If you take it, you lose your queen. But just rook g1. And, and you know, you have two ways of winning a one position, folks. You can, like I always say, uh, take it to an endgame. Or you can just deliver a checkmate. And uh, Bacro plays a very nice move, queen c1 and queen b2. And he decides to just very calmly take it to the endgame. And this is uh, easily winning for white. Uh, for black. <laughs> Not for white. Uh, for white, it would be really impressive to win this. Actually, it would be more impressive for black to lose this than for white to win this. 
Um, and uh, this is winning because black has too many islands. What am I saying? Oh my God, white has too many islands. Folks, I'm sorry. What am I, I gotta, hold on. Coffee time, I'm almost distracted by all this banging on the roof and crazy. I'm very mad. No one told me that this was gonna be happening today. Um, Interesting, by the way, that fe6 is not played to keep the pawns together, but king e6 to make sure that the pawn stays an f pawn, not an e pawn. He doesn't want the pawn closer to the white pieces. Uh, plays king e6, and um, cleanup crew is what I call this. Brings the king, pawn comes closer, and um, he ends up just using the, the, the f pawn. All right? right? It's kind of interesting that he kept the pawn an f pawn, otherwise it would have become an e pawn. And uh, the story of the final portion of the rapid was Etienne Bacro, folks. It was Etienne Bacro. Um, it was the fact that he ended the, um, the, the, he only played the rapid portion. He actually, you know, he was supposed to swap with Kramnik, but look at the way the rapid finished. Bacro was in third place. I mean, it's a guy we haven't heard of. This is awesome. This dude beat like three people, drew some games, and he actually started, if you remember, let me just pull up the standings from uh, day one. He started at the bottom. I mean, but this, these are the standings after day one. Who's at the bottom? Back row, right? With one point. I mean, it's close. Obviously, it's close, but back row roars back. Um, and what, what are some of the other stories? Well, Wesley So and Jan, obviously, uh, dominant, absolutely dominant. Uh, Firuja struggles. Doesn't win a game in the Rapid at all. Last place. Absolutely last place. Just last, I mean, I, I, I can't sugarcoat that, right? So, Firuja's in last. What's going to happen in the Blitz? And obviously, we got the middle of the pack, guys. We got Peter Svidler from Russia, MVL, Aranyan. But now, we have to play some Blitz. So, the Blitz was quite an adventure. Um, the, the Blitz was an adventure. And the first person that we see in the Blitz is Vladimir Kramnik. He was invited back for the Blitz. And Vladimir came to play. Uh, he played one of his early games. I have to honor him against Peter Svidler. You know, Kramnik in his career was not much of an E4 player. He played Knight F3, D4, C4. He would strangle you to death um, with gloves on so there were no fingerprints for the cops. Um, but he came out, you know, guns blazing in the Blitz. Uh, Nidorf on the board plays the Sozin, the Fisher Sozin attack with Bishop C4. And um, the point is you develop like this, you know, you plop all your pieces out. And uh, H5 is the modern version of this. We see this a lot now in the Sicilians. We just saw back row do this, right? You know, I choose my games kind of in logical order. Um, A3 is a novelty, but really it's, you know, the Bishop can always kind of hang out here. Uh, this game gets exciting right here because f4 knight g4 long castles take my bishop Svidler says all right and you might wonder well, why doesn't Svidler go here it's kind of funny this one th these are these are serotonin moves you know they're like ah me attack queen me so smart yeah but now your knight is offside now i'm just gonna attack it your knight just becomes a target for my attack and you'll notice the structure actually kind of looks very similar to the structure that we just saw in that other game. And there, there is some overlap. I mean, this was a different opening, but it kind of becomes like a classical Sicilian a little bit. But we have g6 and actually bishop h6. So the bishop goes into an entirely separate direction. Uh, we, don't, we don't see a, a completely similar structure. Um, queen f3 played to get out of the pin, rook c8. And now, folks, there's a pawn break in this position for white, uh, which leads to a devastating attack. That piece is destabilized. Queen is right here. So, of course, f5. And it doesn't matter what black does, because one of these pawns will be taken, or you have to take yourself and open up the board. We have G GF5, EF5, and E5. This is the only way that you can keep the position closed. And now you would think that Kramnik will go back and figure it out, you know, positional weaknesses here on the light squares. <laughs> it's Blitz. Knight to E6! And you can't take. I mean, if you take, then I get this, and I get this, and the game is over. So, Queen C6. And now I bring my second knight. And the, of course, we're not going to trade queens. I'm not going to trade queens with you if I want to lead an attack. Um, knight takes d5, bishop takes d5. Now, the funny thing is, the best move in this position is actually to play like queen h3. Knight d5 looks really cool. The computer doesn't like it, but I, 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 we don't need to. Again, chess can be enjoyed without the computer, okay? It's like walking through a museum and being like, oh, wow, that's like a really beautiful piece of art. And then somebody comes by and like, well, actually, like, no, it just looks nice. All right, leave me alone. Queen knight takes, bishop takes, queen c2, king a1. This looks like a beautiful attacking position for white. White is about to play queen h5, queen f7, bring the rook, shatter the whole center. Uh, black can hang on here with the computer move bishop c6. Um, and uh, this kind of takes the wind out of white's sails because after queen takes h5, uh, there is this. 
this, and this move. Queen takes g2. And uh, you're just in time to, like, kind of guard everything and play the only computer move, rook h7. Which, again, if Peter Sviller found, he should be scanned with a metal detector. So, instead of that, we get the far more human rook g8, queen h5, and Kramnik leading this nice attack, knight d4. The knight does its job being a nuisance on e6, and to finish the game, it jumps back to d4, hits the queen, and now there is just a devastating mate, their bishop hanging, everything is hanging. Kramnik wins in 24 moves versus his Russian compatriot, uh, Peter Svidler. However, Kramnik did struggle in the blitz. More on that later. First, I would like to show you uh, Firuja. Uh, Firuja, I I'm going to actually jump ahead in this game um, to right around here. Firuja won five and a half out of his first six games in the blitz. Remember I told you he struggled? Well, he got five and a half out of six, and he did it in ways like this. He would do it by baiting his opponents into tactical sequences. E5, blundering a fork. Oh no, my knight. Bishop takes F7. Like, the way he makes it look against these super gems, knight into E6 attacking. King G8, knight takes D8. And when the dust settles, e takes d4, rook takes, bishop takes, queen to h5, threatening an infiltration on the back rank, and queen d5 check if it's ready. Knight back to d6, queen d5, and when the dust settles, look at that, sack the queen, sack the queen for the fork. And when the dust settles, just king h1. And he ended this game actually with a really nice trick as well, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. He ended this game, this was the top clip on Reddit. Um... He got all the pawns off the board, and he had to find a way to win this. I mean, the bishops are very tricky. What do you have to not blunder here when the bishops are on the board? A fork. And he opened up his king, and right here, it looked like he blundered. And actually, the commentators thought he blundered. They were like, oh no, he blundered. He didn't. He actually saw that after bishop e4 check, king f2, bishop c6, he has knight e7. And in the time scramble, it was Ranyan who missed this, and when he realized, he resigned. So... Alegrezzo was popping off, five and a half out of six, but then he ran into Wesley So. And again, in this game, I'm going to fast forward to the middle game because Alegrezzo tried to go on a similar attack. He actually played the same opening that he did against Levon, and he started to open up the position with e4. Wesley So is a very sober defender. That's like the best way I can describe it because when you play really like drunk type chess in blitz very aggressive dynamic and people bite and they play into your style it's momentum blitz is very momentum based as you just saw kramnik defeat svidler so wesley and i wanted to show this game plays very sobering defense knight takes d4 he's very good at just like hey wake up can you walk in a straight line no take this breathalyzer so we have cd4 Queen takes f5, Ali Reza plays back to d3. On a surface, this position looks really, really dynamic for white because you can play moves like queen e4, creating mate threats. h6, queen g4. Here, here. Bishop a4 attacks the rook, the rook moves out of the way. Now, this is just a free pawn. Do you dare take it? Because if you play bishop takes d4, I will play rook to e4, paralyzing both of your bishops and threatening rook to g4. Obviously, you can't take it, except for the fact that he's Wesley freaking so. And he sees that after rook e4, bishop f6, attacking the queen, that just because the bishop is hanging and there's rook g4, he actually can just play rook takes d3. And it doesn't matter what you do, because if you play rook g4 here and take... Remember I told you that Wesley So is a sobering defensive player? Here Wesley So finds the brilliant counter shot. Queen b2! Oh my goodness, and if you take it, you are back rank mated. So Ali Reza now is on the defense. We have Rook down to C1, and when you've been attacking for like t attacking for like 10 moves and you've been getting that emotion up, um, it all gets, you know, your umbrella gets popped. Rook takes F1, you can't take with the queen because your knight is hanging, and if you play like this, Wesley plays the absolutely soul-sucking queen to B5. Your Rook is under attack, and you cannot defend against this discovered attack, um, and the game is over. This was Ali Reza's only loss of Blitz in the first day, and I wanted to show it because it just shows you how brutal Wesley So is. Like, Wesley's up there, man. Wesley is up there for a reason, and he just takes the wind out of your sails completely. Um, and I, you know, just wanted to show it because I wanted to show it. Now, um, there was one more game that I that I wanted to show, uh, and, and it was um, it, it, it was Nepo versus Ali Reza in the Blitz, and it was part of Ali Reza's run, uh, Ali Reza had blundered very early in the game. Like, this is the position on move, what is it? Move 9. Ali Reza's busted. 
Like, he, th this is terrible. This is under attack. He can't guard everything. In fact, after f6, which looks like it attacks the knight and defends this knight, it doesn't because there's queen e5. And if you take, there is this. I mean, imagine if the game ended like that. Um, and so, I mean, he, he plays d5, and, and Nepo was just hunting him down from the opening. Material is equal, but black is, gr like, grossly lagging in development, just under belligerent pressure. Of course, no queen trade, no queen trade when, when you're attacking. But Nepo got a really nice position and had to, like, shred it all open, right? He, like, he's got everything he wants. He's got Ali Reza not castled. He's got Ali Reza's pieces not coordinated whatsoever. And the center structure is just under pressure. Rookie one comes. Like every piece that Nepo has is playing. And here, Long Castles. And Long Castles uh, probably just loses to something like Queen C5, uh, Queen C6, and Rook takes E6. When you will lose one pawn, probably you will lose the second pawn. And you'll just be down two pawns. But Nepo plays Rook takes E6 first. Thinking that after takes, queen c5, now there is no queen c6, queen c7, king e8, queen g7, rook g8, queen b7. Wait. How is Nepo down a rook? Jan must have thought that he was winning here by virtue of some sort of combo. But he just mixed up his move order, and this is the way blitz works sometimes. Like, the, sometimes you win games like the way Ali Reza won against Levon, where you bam, 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 beautiful attack. And sometimes you need a little bit of luck. You need the chess gods to be, to be watching over you a little bit. It's blitz. Like, sometimes you play on momentum, and sometimes the momentum goes in your favor. And, you know, this game was still totally nuts, because after bishop d5, if you play rook d5, I check you and I pick up your rook, and now I have four pawns for a knight. Like, Jan is up four pawns here. But Ali Reza finds king g7, and you can't take my queen because of back rank mate, and now I am threatening to play rook d5 because that's no longer a check, so we have c4. Jan has four pawns for the rook. Jan is only down one point of material here. He's down a rook, but he's got four extra pawns. This is this game. The rook is now given back, okay? So Ali Reza thought that after c5, uh, I'm sorry, Ali Reza must have thought that there was something after queen f6, but c5 just traps his rook. His rook is just trapped now. Cannot take... And uh, now Ali Reza goes from being uh, up a rook for four pawns uh, to being down three pawns. Now it's plus five. G3, rook e7. And, uh, you know, it's blitz. So now we got a knight. Never resign when you have a knight on the board. Queen f6, threatening some, I don't even know, g4, h4, h5, uh, h5, h4. I mean, rook e7, h5, h4, h3, pushing it all the way down. I mean, blitz is, blitz is it's, it's lunacy. I mean, queen f5, like, look at this, is completely lost. It's completely lost for black. Black has nothing. Queen h6, but Ali Reza is finding a way to keep all his pieces on the board and create just the most nagging threats. And now, because he pushed this pawn all the way here and this king is cut off on the back rank, there's always going to be back rank weaknesses. Like, this is going to be a problem. Right now, there is an absolutely brutal threat in this position. You know what that threat is? Like, for example, bishop c2, queen takes d1, bishop takes a knight f3, and whatever you take this with, I mate you on e1. I mean, this is crazy. Knight to g4. Rook f1, I mean, there is just this lingering threat. Rook to e3, and it actually ended up resulting in Nepo blundering back his bishop, and Ali Reza just hunting him, him down now with his pieces. And he went on to win this game by trading down into an endgame, but at the end of the day, it's the h3 pawn. So when you need to create counterplay, keep as many pieces on the board as possible, attack your opponent's king, and oftentimes those flank pawn pushes do come in handy to create just enough compensation uh, in the attack. But... Oh, the standings um, after the first day of Blitz uh, were still Wesley So uh, in the hunt for that first place, and Yanni Pomnici catching up, but Ali Reza Firuja won the first day of Blitz, folks. He won the first day of Blitz. He had six and a half points out of nine, um, and the final day didn't have as much dramatic stuff. Um, I, I the, the last day was... Very, very close. It was a three, like, three, uh, two-horse race between Wesley and Jan. There wasn't a, a, a whole lot of games to show. Uh, I mean, obviously, n nothing significantly as exciting as the rest of the games. Um, Wesley won a, a really nice long end game versus MVL. Uh, I will show you that. Uh, not the entire game, but I'll kind of jump ahead here. Um, this was like a 70-move game, but it was just so, it was just so nice how Wesley 
had the bishop pair in the end game and you know in, in all end games you need you need kind of sides of weaknesses and because you are the only one on the board with the dark squared bishop pressuring the two pawns that can't move because if one moves you take one if the other moves right so i just wanted to show the way wesley won this by trading the queens and bringing his king because wesley has a big asset down the center of the board which is the pass pawn um and he's got dominant control like the bishop pair means you have dominant control of both sides of the board He's able to play moves like King H4, giving away this because he can go to F5 and then pick this up. So even though Black has a knight, it's just he's just unable to do anything with it. And um, look at this. Look at this king march into H6. The flank pawn advanced to H5 is now threatened. And um, he threatens all of that. And he advances on both sides. This is just such a nice game. I just wanted to kind of show the highlight of this game to just how dominant he is. The defense, the end game abilities. I mean, look at this. The king walk in, the flank pawn advance, this advance to make that a weakness. Beautiful game from Wesley. So he wins the H pawn. He ends up having a pass the H pawn. Black has to sacrifice the bishop. It look at this bishop sacrifice to deflect the king away. And um it, you know, I, I I would love to end on some crazy explosive note, but um I think that's a good note to end on. And and I will show you the results. Nobody was able to catch Wesley. And your final standings look like this. Um, Wesley So wins the, uh, the Blitz ultimately with 12 and a half points. Um, he, but Firuja, I mean, Firuja was absolutely incredible in the Blitz with 11. So Firuja finished the Blitz with uh, 11 points. It was Nepo up there as well. That was the kind of the final day of the Blitz, and your overall standings look like this. Let me just make expand this with the Rapid and the Blitz. Wesley, 24 and a half, Jan, and MVL in Firuja. Firuja went from last to a tie for third, and Firuja is now number four in the world in Blitz. MVL is third, and we have Kikaru and Magnus up top. Yeah. Or actually, no. I think Wesley's, Wesley is uh, third in the world in Blitz. Let me just go confirm this. I, it, I don't think it's MVL. I think MVL is fifth. Uh, Blitz. MVL is eighth. I apologize. In Blitz, it's, um, it's Wesley So who's third. How is MVL? Oh, I guess MVL didn't have a, a great Blitz run. I guess he did better in the Rapid. I apologize. Yeah, Jan is sixth in the world in Blitz, and uh, Firuj is fourth. So, long recap, folks. But before we go, I just want to draw attention your attention to something. Um, so, Wesley hasn't... So Wesley played 36 games, okay? He's played 36 games uh, in Bucharest and, and Paris. Rapid Blitz and Classical, he's lost one. He was undefeated in Bucharest, and he lost one game in the Rapid portion to Aranyan. He is, he, he is undefeated almost in 36 games. This man is for real. Whatever Wesley's doing, he's in peak form right now, top three in the world in Blitz, but Ali Reza also making that push for it. And um, yeah. Sorry I missed this tournament while I was playing in Vegas, but hopefully this recap suffices. I appreciate you all. I know you guys tell me you like the long videos. Some of you don't, but some of you say you'd watch if I made an hour-long video. So if you made it this far in the video, I appreciate you very much. Cheers to my black iced coffee uh, to all of you. And I will see you in the next video. Peace out. Get out of here.